Hi there, my name's Navin, and I know why your Walston Method tank sucks. I'm going to show you how I built this 3-gallon Walston Method cube aquarium while explaining solutions to common problems people encounter when creating a Walston Method tank. A lot of the information covered in this video is coming from Diana Walstead's book, The Ecology of the Planted Aquarium. Walstead Method tanks are known for having a soil substrate and being heavily planted, so if your tank sucks, we probably need to look into these two areas first. The goal in a Wallstead Method tank is finding a balance between these two areas. They go hand in hand. You're going to be less likely to succeed if you neglect one side, so we have to consider both. Let's talk about our substrate first, and then we'll move on to plants. Chapter 7 is all about your substrate. If your water is murky, and whenever you test it, the nitrates are high and you can't get it to go down, you probably either have the wrong substrate or the wrong amount of substrate. Let's take a look. Wrong substrate. Wallstead method tanks have a substrate consisting of two layers. The bottom layer is soil, and the top layer should be sand. In the top layer of your substrate, if you're using pea gravel or small pebbles, because of their larger size, they can't compact as tightly as grains of sand do. This means that there's going to be a lot of nutrients from your soil leaching its way up into your water column because the soil layer is not being sealed tightly enough by the gravel that's placed on top of it. The gaps in between the gravel allows for more room for exchange between the layers. Sand can create a tighter barrier to really keep the soil and nutrients packed down underneath. Finer gravel generally can work as a top layer in Wallstead Method tanks, however you may experience a longer time period of nutrients from the soil leaching into the water column. However, if you use a very fine sand such as silt or play sand for your top layer, it may compress too tightly against the soil and you run the risk of the soil never having any exchange with the other layers and becoming anaerobic. Anaerobic means that in this soil layer there is little to no oxygen. This leads to the decomposition of organic matter in the soil, which causes the buildup of gases such as hydrogen sulfide. If you ever heard people complaining about how in their Wallstead Method tank the substrate exploded, it's because in their soil layer this buildup of gas was unable to pass through the densely packed top layer above it. You want the grain size of your top layer to be big enough for gases to freely escape through it and not stay trapped underneath. The wrong amount of substrate. Let's say the material of your top layer is fine, but you're still testing high amounts of ammonia, nitrites, and nitrates. Then, you may need to add more substrate to your sand layer. The main thing is that we want to add a little bit more to our sand cap, but we do not want to add an excessive amount of sand. Do not use 4 inches of sand over 1 inch of soil. We just want to cap the soil, not bury it. On the flip side, if your sand cap is too thin, you risk breaching it and having the soil from underneath stir into your water. This makes a mess of your whole tank and causes a spike in ammonia, nitrites, and nitrates because all of the nutrients from your soil is now being suspended into the water in the tank. When first starting out, I recommend only using 1 inch of soil capped by 2 inches of sand. This is just a safe recommendation for beginners. In my 55 gallon tank, I have 2 inches of organic potting soil capped by 2 inches of black diamond blasting sand, and in my 3 gallon cube aquarium, I have less than 2 inches total of substrate. The extra sand to soil ratio is forgiving on beginners, especially because it won't be as easy to breach that sand cap and makes planting rooted plants much easier. While we're on the topic of nutrients leaching into our water column, your tank probably sucks because it's not heavily planted enough. Let's switch to the other side to see how plants could help remedy the situation. If you are sure that your substrate is not the problem and your sand cap is thick enough and the soil is not breaching anywhere into the water column but you still experience ammonia, nitrites, or nitrates, it's probably because you need to add more plants. Your tank probably is not heavily planted enough, and you should add specifically fast-growing plants. When you first set up your substrate layers and then fill water into your tank, this will be when nutrients are at their highest. We need to capitalize on this moment. We need to add plants to use these nutrients before algae gets a chance to establish itself, and the best way to do this is floating plants. I'm not talking about your piece of Anubius that you didn't tie down or super glue correctly and now it's just free floating all over the aquarium. I'm talking about doing this. My tank is now exponentially better at processing waste. 
Chapter 8 in Diana's book, The Aerial Advantage, is all about how floating plants are the real heavy lifters when it comes to processing nutrients in your tank. There are many advantages to having floating plants. If you don't have them in your tank, you need to get them. You need to embrace duckweed. Floating plants reproduce quickly, convert ammonia, nitrates, and nitrites into new plant growth, and they do this exceptionally well because their leaves can access carbon dioxide from the surface air. Hence why this chapter is called the aerial advantage. If you have slow growing plants like Anubius or Java Fern, these aren't going to be the heavy lifters that you need in your aquarium. You do not need expensive plants and you do not need plants with high light requirements. You simply need the plants that grow well in your tank. Try Dwarf Sagittaria and species of stem plants like Ludwigia, Bacopa, and Hygrophila. But ultimately, even with all of these submerged plants, they're not going to be as effective as a tank covered in floating plants. There is this other consideration mentioned in Chapter 8 where stem plants like Bacopa and Ludwigia can grow starting in your aquarium water and then grow eventually out of the tank into the surface air. Scientifically speaking, they do start to process nutrients at a better rate because some of the plant is exposed to the carbon dioxide in the air. However, if you're struggling, I would say just don't worry about that and focus mainly on floating plants. Your tank may also suck because you have no circulation in your water. But Wallstead Method Aquariums are supposed to be no filter and they're supposed to be low tech. I don't want to add a filter. I don't care. If your tank is a stagnant box of water and you're wondering why your plants aren't growing, your solution may be to add an air stone or sponge filter to increase the circulation in your tank. Chapter 6, Plant Nutrition and Ecology, explains how low to moderate flow increases the plant's effectiveness at absorbing nutrients and photosynthesizing. Chapter 2, Plants as Water Purifiers, explains how duckweed is more effective at removing ammonia when there is some circulation compared to no circulation. Now, there is such a thing as too much circulation. With very high flow, floating plants may melt and other plants may get stressed and not photosynthesize as effectively. On the flip side, if your tank is heavily planted but you still can't keep shrimp or fish alive, your solution is probably also adding an air stone or sponge filter. In a tank with no surface agitation, at night especially when the lights are off, your plants are just giving off carbon dioxide into the stagnant box of water. At night, they're not really oxygenating the aquarium in the way that we think that they do. By adding some bubbles into your aquarium, they raise to the surface, break the surface tension, and allow for the exchange of gases. This keeps your aquarium fully oxygenated even at night. If you're a beginner to the Wallstead style aquariums and need a good baseline understanding of this style of aquariums, you should check out my complete guide to the Wallstead method video I have on my channel. I purposefully aim to not rehash the same information in this video, so it'll be a good use of your time and you'll gain a comprehensive understanding of the Wallstead method style aquarium in about 10 minutes. Thank you so much for watching my third YouTube video. I'm intentionally uploading this video without waiting for the plants to fully grow in, so consider subscribing so you don't miss the update video of when I add shrimp into this tank. Additionally, I make these educational videos for free, so if you'd like to support my content, my Patreon is linked in the description below, and your donations will help me make more high-quality videos for everyone to enjoy. I love reading your feedback and stories, so please leave a comment down below regardless if your tank sucks or not. I hope you have a great rest of your day.